uh, uh, obviously I, uh, I will be talking to you mostly about the adolescent brain, but in fact I will start even earlier than that. I'll start uh, you, uh, in, in future life, and what I will try to explain to you is why we should care uh, about what's happening in utero, uh, in the womb, uh, if we are interested in aging. So really the bottom line for us, we were just talking about it, uh, the kind of the model of, of our work is what we want to learn is so that we can die healthy. So that's, that's the <laughs> ultimate goal, uh, how to die healthy. Now, I've been uh, doing brain research for a long time, and uh, we have learned over the past well, century a lot of many different things about how the brain is organized, both functionally and structurally. But also we have learned, especially with imaging over the past 20 or 30 years, that there is tremendous amount of variability in that organization. And about 10 years ago, I became much more interested in what drives that uh, variability. And I'm, I mean within the normal range. I'm not talking about patients and diseases. And if you are interested in that, you have to uh, start wondering about the genes and the environment and, of course, the interplay between the two. And that's uh, how uh, we started thinking about a discipline that I call population neuroscience. And I will start by telling you about population neuroscience, what we mean by that. Then I'll tell you about uh, uh, some, some interesting uh, pieces of knowledge that we have learned about in utero adversity and risk genes. Then I'll move on into fetal programming of addiction and obesity, and that's of course, both of them are the starting point of, if you like, healthy aging, and I'll finish by telling you about our current work uh, uh, setup of multi-generational brain and body study that we started here in Toronto. There is there are no data, no results yet. I'll just show you how we are doing. Okay, so that's the plan. So first, population neuroscience. It's really a combination of three main disciplines, epidemiology, genetics, and neuroscience. The first two are relevant in terms of exposures in epidemiology. If any of you are epidemiologists, exposures is what epidemiologists like, what it is that starts a change. Now, exposures in epidemiology are primarily external exposures. In genetics, I think of genes and the proteins as, if you like, internal exposures. But then we need to measure outcomes, and that's where uh, neuroscience and certainly my expertise comes in, because I'm interested in the brain, and the different functional and structural properties of the brain are the outcomes that, that I care about. So let me take you uh, briefly through each of those three disciplines. Epidemiology, a little bit of history, started in uh, about uh, mid-1800s when, uh, and, and it's interested uh, primarily uh, in associations between external exposures and outcomes. And traditionally it was really infectious agents, that, that's where epidemiology started. And, and really what, you, what epidemiologists want to do is to calculate risk ratio as a ratio of uh, of uh, probability of being uh, of having a disorder, for example, as a probability of exposed to non-exposed. And the history really starts here in London in 1850s when John Snow, uh, a London physician, noticed that uh, cases of cholera accumulated uh, in uh, areas of London where people were taking water from particular wells, but not other wells. And even though he had no idea what caused their association, uh, he uh, obviously, even there, there was a, a very clear public health uh, consequence of discovering uh, the association. And, and whenever I'm reading reviews of some of our grounds where people are somewhat dismissive of finding associations, I'm thinking of this study that even though the causal relationship was unknown, the bristol cholera was discovered 20 years later, Already, of course, knowing about an association uh, had profound impact on the health of the population. So associations very often are a very good starting point, and of course we need to figure out uh, what the relationships are. Now, uh, here is another association for which we have no idea what the relationship is, and that's association between early events and later disease. Now, 
that's an association between preterm birth and psychiatric illness, studied in a cohort of over a million uh, uh, individuals uh, in a registry in Sweden. And as you can see, being born uh, prematurely is associated with a higher probability of uh, mood disorders, in particular of bipolar uh, disorder. You can see the risk ratio 7.2, 7.4, that's huge. Now, what's going on? What was, uh, what was specifically disturbed uh, by the premature birth? Of course, we don't know, but that's again a very good example of how epidemiology can set us on hopefully the right path when we are trying to figure out what's going on. Now, genetics, of course, uh, incredibly powerful tools and knowledge that we have accumulated over the past 30 years or so. Two aspects of genetics, the, the classical genetics, DNA sequence, and genetic variations in that DNA sequence. More or less, most of the common variations and differences uh, between us can be captured by about a million or less uh, single nucleotide polymorphisms. But we know that uh, those variations do not explain uh, all the heritability of different traits, and that's when uh, we are in a frustrated way to, uh, when we talk about missing heritability. There is a lot of heritability that we cannot explain by simply look at, uh, looking at those single nucleotide polymorphisms. And one complicated factor, but exciting conceptually, is epigenetics. I'm sure that you've heard about it uh, in one particular way, in which environment can change the probability of a gene being expressed. So it doesn't, uh, of course, what, what counts is not to have a gene, but uh, uh, having that gene uh, do its job, and that starts with the expression of the gene. And that expression can be modified by uh, epigenetic processes such, such as methylations, histone modifications, and many other regulations that are influencing gene expression. And that's how people sometimes talk about environment getting under the skin, uh, basically influencing environment, influencing genes, if you like, in this, in this way. Now, finally, neuroscience. Uh, it's really, uh, in, my, uh, uh, in my work, it's really imaging, because imaging is a, a Imaging in particular with magnetic resonance imaging is an extremely powerful tool that allows us to push a large cohort, hundreds or thousands of people through a, a scanner, and those scanners are available everywhere, and then uh, generate, of course, images that are uh, quantitative representative, well, pictorial representations of uh, quantitative uh, phenotypes that we can derive from those images. And, and I've been involved in many studies of the developing brain, uh, some of them I'll tell you about in a minute, but here's just a list of uh, some of those existing MR cohorts with the number of uh, different typically developing children or adolescents involved uh, or included in those studies, including some cohorts that are specifically looking at aging, the ages, Iceland study, of about 5,000 individuals. And there are other that, that I'm not mentioning here. Now, why imaging and what we do with imaging? We have at least two things that we can do with MRI. Uh, we can uh, get images of brain function, and that's when we talk about functional MRI. But we can get also uh, a lot of images of brain structure. Now, brain structure is not boring. It's very exciting. In fact, I'm much more excited about this than that. Uh, for many reasons that I don't have time to get into. One being that uh, with structural imaging, I can cover the whole brain in an even way, whereas with functional imaging, I have to decide which, which circuit I'm interested in and then design or use a paradigm for that circuit. So I'm now measuring only one circuit at a time. So I cannot cover the whole brain in an even way with functional imaging. And as any other behavior dependent, uh, uh, a tool, functional imaging is much noisier uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the variability and, and, and test retest reliability than any kind of structural imaging. So that these are two main reasons why I put a lot of emphasis on structural imaging in addition to function. Now, uh, why is structural imaging interesting? Because uh, brain structure is extremely dynamic. 
We are not born with uh, a brain that does not change after a certain age. It keeps changing all the time until uh, the old age and not simply because of disease. No, it's changing, reflecting, of course, our experiences. So that's why I, I talk about brain morphology as a window into the individual's history. And we've known for a long time from animal studies that if, for example, you put uh, pups, uh, rat, uh, little rats, after weaning at the, uh, when they are about 30 days old, you put them in different types of environments for just 30 days, their brains will be completely different in many different, uh, in many different ways. Their brain's morphology will be different, right? All those different components will be different. Now, of course, with MRI, uh, we don't have uh, the kind of detail or resolution to, to be counting all those components, so we have to be careful when we interpret our findings in terms of what uh, might be driving those. And, and you see in one cubic millimeter of mouse cortex, we have, of course, all those different things mixed together. So it's just one, one has to be careful when, when interpreting what we find. But we can find it. Now, uh, let me move on now and I'll, I'll speak about uh, some of the findings that we obtained in those two different studies. One that, that we started here in Canada about 10 years ago, and the other one uh, which is a multi-center study that uh, we are part of uh, in, in Europe. And I'll tell you, I'll use the data from those two studies to illustrate those two points. So let's start with the brain growth and adversity. Now, the adversity we chose to study is, uh, is, a, is an adversity that is unfortunately still uh, very common, and that's smoking during pregnancy. Now, as you can see, in the 60s, almost half of the pregnant women smoke. So, in fact, people my age, it's 50-50 that, that, that my mother smoked or not, with all the consequences I'll tell you about in a minute, or associations, right? So, you have to be careful here. Now, it's wonderful that it dropped yeah, up, up to uh, you know, early 2000, but it's less wonderful that it actually stayed unchanged. And it's still, on average, 10%. Now, in different populations, it may be much higher. So here are new data from the US, and you can see non-Hispanic whites, the average is 20%, right? It's the Hispanic mothers who don't smoke that much during pregnancy. And of course, SES would, uh, would influence this. Maternal education is the best predictor, of course, of smoking during pregnancy. So this is just to say that this adversity is not only interesting uh, from scientific point of view, it's a still uh, a serious public health issue uh, in light of what I will tell you. Now, I should also say that uh, the first publication about an association between smoking during pregnancy and low birth weight was published in about 1959, I think, right? So the doctors knew about at least this particular association for a long time, but even in the 60s, uh, I know of people who told me that their mother was, uh, was it was recommended to her by her physician to smoke so that the baby is smaller and the delivery is easier, right? So, anyway, lots of things are happening, of course, if you smoke. Uh, of course, nicotine uh, would have many different effects, reducing appetite of the mother, decreasing the, the flow of blood into the fetus, of course, pharmacological effects, but altogether, you are ending up with malnutrition, hypoxia, and the pharmacological effects. Now, you add to it, of course, carbon monoxide. You have another uh, source of hypoxia. So the fetus is, of course, being deprived. No wonder that it's smaller than uh, when, uh, when it's born, even at term, even though uh, uh, smoking also increases preterm birth. Now, let me show you what we can do with imaging now to look at, at a fetus of a smoking and no, non-smoking mother. So that's just simply imaging uh, babies in utero at uh, 24 weeks of age. And you can see we, uh, we can really get a lot of information from that single scan. We can measure the volume of the brain, of the kidneys, of the liver, of the lungs, of course the total. We can even, and I didn't do that, you see that the fat 
at, at the bottom of the feet here. We could measure that. We can also count the fingers uh, here, right? Uh, the, the baby is scratching her head, it seems, uh, wondering what that noise is that she is hearing. <laughs> Now, uh, with this study, it's a very small study, so I'm just showing it to you uh, just to illustrate uh, uh, the point here. Of course, we see that those uh, uh, mothers, well, the fetuses of the mothers who smoke in black, uh, who are smoking, as we are scanning them, right? Uh, the growth of the baby is not as steep as it is in the non-smoking mothers. And we try to match them well on maternal education, right? But again, you, you will always have confounders, uh, especially in a small study like this. So yes, the whole body is not growing uh, as well as, uh, as the one of non-smoking mothers. But what about uh, the different organs? We see a huge effect on kidneys. The kidneys are growing even less than the whole body is. We can see that the brain is growing also much less than uh, the brains of fetuses of mothers who are not smoking during pregnancy. And that argues against the idea that there is brain sparing, that we, we heard very often about that, uh, yes, the whole body may, may be affected, but the brain is spared. It is not spared. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's happening basically the same thing is happening to that brain uh, as, as it's happening to other organs. Now, you can see that at, uh, towards the end of pregnancy, just smoking explains about 13% of variance in the size of the brain. And that's a sort of decent number when it's something that, uh, that you can potentially do something about, right? Well, although not that easy with the 10% of mothers on average still smoking, there is obviously prevention reached probably its, uh, its limits. Now, uh, of course, now let me move uh, forward, uh, 12 to 18 years forward, and ask whether the brain is still different in the adolescence of mothers who smoke during pregnancy or not. And, and now I'll be talking about results that we, we got in our Sagona Youth Study that we started, as I told you, almost 10 years ago, as a study of long-term effects of smoking during pregnancy on brain structure and behavior, but also on cardiovascular and metabolic health, and we completed the study by scanning, testing, genotyping over 1,000 teenagers. And the reason that that uh, we are doing the study in Southern Lac Saint Jean region in Quebec is that uh, it's a population that is more culturally and genetically homogeneous, and therefore it's easier for us to look for genes of complex traits. Now. When we look simply at the brain size, there are no differences between non-exposed and exposed uh, in girls or in boys. But what we wondered was, could it be that individuals with certain genes may have been more vulnerable to this effect? And the first thing that we needed to do was to find which genes are important for brain growth. And, and, and what for this reason, we uh, carried out what is called genome-wide association study, where you take 500,000 single nucleotide polymorphisms that cover the entire genome so that you have uh, a representation of those genetic variations and genetic differences, and then you ask one by one which region of the gene, if any, is associated with, in this case, total brain size. And that's exactly what we did, and you can imagine that because you are asking 500,000 times, you have to correct for those multiple comparisons, and that's why you need a p-value of this, uh, of this uh, little value, 10 to the power of minus n. And with this criterion, we did find, but only in girls, a region on the genome that has something to do that explain a, a significant, well, reasonable portion of variance in brain size. Now we ask whether but that, uh, so this is, this is now uh, the amount of brain volume, the variance explained in uh, those girls whose mother smoked, and you can see we explain up to 19% of variance, which is really high for a single SNP. Usually the effects are really tiny, uh, a percentage point or so. Now, in the non-exposed, we see more or less the same. So there is no interaction really between genes, this particular genetic variant, and exposure, the environment. But then we ask, well, this is just total brain size. How about 
uh, asking about three uh, other properties uh, that, that are important. The total amount of cortex, so that's the cortical area, uh, how much folded it is, of course those two would be very much interrelated, but also how thick the cortex is. And when we uh, now calculated the numbers for those three, the bottom line is there was a huge effect on the cor cortical area, so how much cortex really you have, but only in the exposed. In non-exposed, there was no effect of the same gene. So you have a very strong gene environment interaction. In other words, it's only if you have two things going on. One, you have this particular variant of this gene, and your mother smoked during pregnancy. Then the two put together have the negative impact on, on the brain. Now, here in, in, this, in the aging seminar, why is it important? Well, brain reserve is a big thing, of course, for Alzheimer's. So my bet is that, of course, those girls, 60, 70 years from now, will be at much higher risk of Alzheimer's disease, right? Well, how to test, we'll have to be patient, we won't get funding for it, but uh, that's just a bet, and, and I think the relevance of uh, findings of this sort, potential relevance. Now, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, just bear with me two slides how it might work. This particular gene uh, may have something to do with the flow of potassium into the cells. Mm -hmm. Potassium is very important for uh, programmed cell death, apoptosis. If there is too much potassium going in, it kills the cells. Now, if this is happening during embryonic development, it can be killing those so-called founder, uh, founder cells and therefore limiting the number of columns and therefore the total surface area because you are really uh, killing those that are uh, dividing in the symmetrical way. So killing one cell would have a huge consequence in the geometric uh, way. So, so that was just an example of smoking and, and brain development. Let's move on now into behavior. Uh, and, and behavior that, that we are interested in, uh, of course, naturally, we are talking about smoking mothers. What about substance use and addiction in the offspring? Now again, we have to be careful about causality. There are many things that will be uh, at play here, including, of course, the environment uh, that is very different, postnatal environment, right? The parents smoking or not smoking. So there are also many social and psychological factors at play. Now, there is another thing. Substance use is not only cigarettes, alcohol, or addiction in that sense, but in fact we are thinking about uh, eating behavior more and more as perhaps also uh, related to addiction, the same reward related processes, because we eat because we like what we eat, that gives us pleasure. The same reward systems may be engaged. And one of the theories of, uh, of addiction is so-called reward deficiency syndrome. So it's not that you are more sensitive to reward, which is kind of the natural thing that one very often thinks about. In fact, it might be the opposite, that, that your reward system is not working as well, and therefore you keep looking for the right reward, and that's the reward deficiency syndrome. So let's, let's think about it as I show you what we found. Let's start first with just simply prevalence of substance use disorders, uh, you can see that, of course, it goes up between early and late adolescence. I should say also that uh, substance use in general, to some extent, is a normative behavior. It's not all bad because, in fact, more than 50% of adolescents, of course, try smoking and drinking, and, and most of us have tried smoking and drinking, whether before 18 or after 18, so uh, the norms are set by us, by the adult society, so we have to be careful there. It's, it's really, one thing is experimentation, the other thing is, of course, problems, disorder, uh, addiction. So let, th this is really experimentation. Uh, with a little bit of problems there because this scale is asking also about problems due to, for example, alcohol 
Now, uh, what we did in Salvador study, the first thing that we asked when we had the first about 300 or 400 uh, kids done, is there a difference in some structural properties between the brains of the adolescents whose mothers smoke versus those uh, that did not smoke during pregnancy? And yes, there is a, a fairly significant difference in the thickness of this region of the brain called orbitofrontal cortex. Uh, the cortex is thinner, and we know that this region is very important for emotion regulation, but also for reward processing, understanding reward value. So we then asked, is it possible that the thickness of the orbitofrontal cortex predicts drug experimentation in those adolescents? And we, uh, we, uh, we simply quantified reward uh, about drug experimentation as the number of different substances that uh, the kid has tried in his or her lifetime, right? The lifetime is 12 to 18 years, remember, right? Now, and the substances would start with cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, these would be the most common ones, but the number can go up to about 12, uh, which was pretty much everything that we listed as uh, a drug that they could have tried, cocaine, heroin, uh, PCP, everything. Okay, so that's the first question. Is there a relationship between cortical thickness here in this region and uh, drug experimentation? And it, as you can see, the, more, the thinner the cortex, the more different drugs the adolescent tried. Now, the effect is very subtle. It's, we explain only 5% of variance in, in the exposed individuals. Now, of course, uh, we don't know anything about causality here, about directionality. But uh, what is informative here is uh, a study that was done in rats here, uh, well, not here, in, in uh, California, where uh, the rats were again exposed prenatally to nicotine, and then as teenagers were offered cocaine. You can see that uh, the control animals, not exposed, uh, happily self-administered cocaine. In fact, the exposed ones would not be interested. They were not interested, they did not self-administer until you offered more than double the dose. Then they started self-administering a dose that was aversive, in fact, to the control animals. So that reward threshold, right, has been raised by the exposure. And we think that it's really happening at the level of the interaction between nicotine and dopaminergic neurons, and there is a lot of animal work that supports that. And that kind of goes with uh, the explanation, the reward deficiency hypothesis, that in fact the exposure to nicotine and anything else in cigarette smoke may increase the reward threshold, and therefore the kids uh, continue to look for the substance or activity in general that would give them the pleasure. Now. So, uh, if that's true, then we should also see that when uh, we are anticipating rewards, regions that are rich in dopamine should not respond as strongly. And we did that in another study with functional MRI in this case, and that's the response to anticipatory reward. And you can see that that response is much higher in adolescents who were not exposed to smoking during pregnancy than those where the mothers did smoke. So that really, again, supports the idea uh, of the reward deficiency uh, uh, syndrome here, or explanation of uh, the exposure effect on uh, drug, well, uh, experimentation with substances. Now, so, so here, uh, you know, putting together all this and, and putting together also with the animal uh, studies, we think that uh, smoking during pregnancy does interfere with the development of the brain, in particular the cortical orbitofrontal cortex, and then later during adolescence when uh, drug experimentation is really a normative uh, behavior, then it increases, this, this effect is increasing uh, the probability of drug experimentation. Now I should say, I think I have it here, that very different thing is happening in non-exposed uh, teenagers, and I don't have time to get into it, but there it seems that uh, the thickness of the orbital frontal cortex is influenced by the behavior rather than uh, the other way around. So it reflects plasticity, use it or lose it if you like. 
the more they engage in drug experimentation, the thicker now the orbital frontal cortex. And we use genetics to prove that that uh, explanation is uh, the most likely, uh, as opposed to uh, what we are finding in the exposed. Okay. Now, before I finish with, uh, with smoking during pregnancy, let me show you also what's happening now uh, with the body. We, we talked about the fact that, uh, of course, uh, the babies born to smoking mothers are smaller for gestational age. And we, we saw it with, when we looked simply at the fetal volume in this uh, little study. But that's something that no one uh, argues about, uh, this, this, this effect of smoking during pregnancy on the growth and birth weight is very well accepted. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, uh, I don't know when, maybe 30 years ago, uh, an epidemiologist in England, uh, Barker, Tony Barker, I think, uh, noticed that there is a relationship between birth weight and, in fact, the cardiovascular disorders. The lower the birth weight, the higher the rate of cardiovascular disorders in uh, adults. Right? And then, gradually, uh, it became uh, clear that uh, smoking during pregnancy may be also affecting not only cardiovascular disorders, but also obesity in the following way. And we showed it in, in this particular study that by the late puberty, the body weight in those who were exposed in utero and therefore small when they were born, and in our study, the difference in weight is close to 300 grams between exposed and non-exposed. They are bigger now. They have higher weight. Uh, they have higher total amount of body fat by 16%. And when we use MRI to quantify it in much more precise way, they have by 26% more of the subcutaneous fat and by 33% more intra-abdominal or visceral fat. And it's the intra-abdominal fat, especially in men, that is most dangerous in, ca in the case of cardiometabolic disorders, hypertension, diabetes, etc. So these are kids that are 15, 16, 17 years old. And we have shown uh, that indeed the amount of fat is predicting in boys, for example, their blood pressure. Now the question is, of course, uh, why? What is driving that, that effect? And of course, uh, it can be, there can be many things, including potentially their food intake. Maybe they eat more or they eat more fat. Now, eating fat uh, results in many more calories uh, that you get uh, as compared with eating protein and sugar for two reasons. There is more energy in fat, but also uh, you don't expend much energy eating fat as you do when you eat protein. Right? So uh, for those two reasons, the intake, the overall amount of energy from fat is much higher than from the other the macronutrients. Now we did measure fat intake in those kids using a 24-hour food recall. And as you can see here, the amount of fat intake in individuals who are above medium in their BMI is much higher in the exposed as compared with the non-exposed. There is no difference in the total amount of energy that they, they took. So it's really specific to the composition of what they most likely like. We did not li uh, ask them what they like, we asked them what they ate. Right? It would be interesting, of course, to know that. Now, uh, what we also discovered, because remember we have the brain data in the same kids, is that the same group of kids have much smaller amygdala. And that's a region that may have something to do with the regulation of eating behavior. For example, amygdala is very important for taste aversion. When something doesn't taste right, amygdala comes in and stops you eating. And it could be, and we can only speculate, that if you have underdeveloped amygdala, 
you don't have enough, strong enough brakes, right? So you can overeat fat, and, and if I have good amygdala, it stops tasting good, at least during that one day, I have to give myself a break. I always think of, I don't know whether anyone knows Schwartz's in Montreal, I love Schwartz's, uh, but only once in three months. So, so probably my amygdala stops me to going back the following day, kind of. So that's kind of the idea here, right? So here, of course, you see how, uh, what might have happened, and again, you know, we are attributing it to prenatal exposure, we cannot be certain about it, but certainly even early on, whatever the reason behind those, uh, those differences in adolescent is, in adolescence is, whatever the reasons are, this is where the teenagers are. And, and that's how they continue and will continue to behave as they are going through their life, right? And that will have, of course, cumulative impact on their health by the time they retire. So, now I, I, I come to the multi-generational brain and body. And, and really, uh, let me motivate the interest now in, in the context of what I said. Well, we know that common chronic disorders cost a lot of money, right? So that's, this is the money. This is the healthy years lost in Americas due to disorders, common chronic disorders of the body and the brain. Now note also that many of them start really during adolescence. And yes, uh, their, their prevalence increases, although, for example, for obesity, it remains the same. But of course, for the consequences of obesity, such as diabetes or hypertension, it then goes up. And that's the cumulative effect of it, right? Now, the reason why uh, the number of healthy years lost is so high and the cost is so high is twofold. One is, we don't really, they don't kill us, those disorders, such as cancer that I put, I think, at the bottom, right? Uh, unfortunately, cancer very often still kills us. Those disorders usually don't kill us in the short term, so we continue living with them and with the disabilities that are being driven by those disorders. And the period uh, with which we, uh, for how long we live with those disorders, can extend from the age of 14 all the way to 70, 75. So the, again, the cumulative effect over time is huge. That's why in our work, we really pay attention to trajectories, starting in utero, as I showed you, trajectories that potentially lead to those disorders. And of course, the hope is that we can learn from the knowledge that we get how to change those trajectories. Two more slides uh, from epidemiology, I found them uh, really instructive. That's the number of uh, Canadians or percentage of Canadians from young to old with two or more disorders, so it's comorbidity. And you can see that by the time we reach 60, at least one third of Canadians have two or more of those disorders. So comorbidity is a huge thing. And it's not surprising. I mean, the disorders that, that I told you about on the body and brain side, they influence each other. We know that obesity is influencing dementia, that depression is comorbid with dementia, addiction, etc. right? So no wonder that there is comorbidity. And finally, I, I find this, this information fascinating that's the percentage of uh, well, population attributable risk of Alzheimer's disease attributable to modifiable risk factors. Over 50% of cases of Alzheimer's are likely due to things that can be changed that are listed here, right? So it's not that you are born with, uh, well, 50% of those who developed Alzheimer's did not have to end up with Alzheimer's if you remove this. Uh, they calculated that if you decrease prevalence of those uh, risk factors by 25%, uh, the number of Alzheimer's cases in the US would drop by half a million. So there is a, a potential, of course, for 
a, a, a really good interventions that would or strategies to decrease this. And obviously, this is not easy. Uh, otherwise, it would have been done a long time ago. All right. So in that context, we are interested in the transgenerational or multi-generational uh, approach where we, we are going to uh, take into account environmental, genetic, and epigenetic influences on the brain and body of the adolescents, their parents, and potentially their grandparents, and do it within the same family so that we can build at least virtual trajectories, right? If we cannot have a longitudinal study that would last for 60 years, then maybe this multi-generational approach would allow us to construct virtual trajectories and learn what is bad and what is good and how we can change it. Just a few slides now how we do it. Uh, our, uh, with imaging in particular, we use again imaging to quantify a, a number of uh, phenotypes or measures uh, about the, the health of the heart the body and the brain, and I'll just show you one by one. So that's how we do the imaging of the heart. Uh, what you need to do is to put uh, these kind of pores, kind of sandwich the body, uh, so that you get a lot of signal uh, from the heart, and then we move our volunteer into the scanner and uh, start the sequence. It takes about 20 minutes to get all the information that we need about the heart and large vessels. And what you get is this. So you get your heart beating. You can see the ventricles contracting. We can then, of course, quantify uh, the amount of heart muscle, how well it's pumping, etc., etc. You see, these are all the measures that we can get. And then we can also look at the uh, big vessels and how blood goes through those vessels. That's aorta here uh, coming off the heart, and we can measure how flexible aorta is because, as you know, uh, the flexibility of the large vessels goes down uh, with the risk factors, and that is, of course, uh, a biggest risk factor of hypertension. So now we move uh, our person out after the 20 minutes. We flip them, as you can see now they go legs first, because we'll be now imaging the body. And we are interested in particular with the in the distribution of fat, inside and outside. And so again, after about 15, 20 minutes, we take them out, and these are the kind of images we get. So now the whole body, and we can, well, there was a lean uh, graduate student, so uh, you don't see a lot of fat. Uh, but we can quantify not only the amount of fat, but also uh, muscle mass. And muscle mass is very important. For example, for diabetes, this is more important than fat. If you, because muscles are buffering and allowing insulin to get in, and uh, glucose, I mean glucose to get in and, and lower the glucose level in the blood. And then we can also focus on this part of the brain so that we get a very good view of how much fat is inside. That's the dangerous visceral fat. Again, not much in, in this young uh, volunteer, but you should see mine. Uh, anyway, uh, it doesn't look pretty sometimes, but it, that's the visceral fat. And finally, uh, we, uh, we, well, okay, we, we also do. Uh, assessment of the heart and, and uh, the cardiovascular parameters over a 60 minute period when we are measuring in fact blood pressure with every heartbeat, not only just once or twice as in the doctor's office. And so we get a lot of information that we can then relate, for example, to the amount of fat. And I was telling you about that, that in boys, if they have more visceral fat, they have high blood pressure. And that's what I'm showing here throughout this 60 minute period. And that's at the age of 14, right? So imagine what's happening in, in our bodies uh, later on when you have uh, more visceral fat uh, in, in, in there. Well, and finally, of course, uh, I'm interested in the brain. So for about 30 minutes, I will be scanning the brain here with, again, now the call goes over the head so I get good signal 
from this part of the body. And, and then we can get lots of images, including uh, the ones like this. This is just simply a structural image that shows us very nice detail of the brain that I can use then to quantify different things like the cortical surface that I showed you and the size of the hippocampus, etc., etc., many different things. So uh, these are all the different measurements that, uh, or, or variables that I can get out of this. So, uh, and then we do cognitive testing with a, uh, with a well-designed cognitive battery and also uh, have a psychiatric interview so that we have information about the mental health of our participants. And of course we take a blood sample so that we have information about uh, genetics but also about the level of different uh, lipids, glucose, etc. So really, at the end of the day, if this program is funded, because it's not right now, then it would allow us really to move forward with constructing those health trajectories in a highly objective way. And we are already beginning to start thinking about personalized preventive medicine, personalized preventive measures, so that we will tell you what would work for you and what you should do, and this will be very different from what would work for me and what I should do. And I think that that's the next step in prevention, because we know that preventive medicine as such and public health as such has its limitation. Even in combination with taxation, policy, just think of smoking. I mean, we've made a huge progress. It took us more than 40 years and still, many people do smoke. And this is just one simple, one single uh, behavior of many health behaviors that we need to address to reduce the number of risk factors that are really affecting at the same time our brains and our bodies. So I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. It was all over our heads. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> in the, um, you picked the one for area uh, because of its uh, being uh, uniform, mostly. So therefore, in a place like Toronto, which has uh, so much other right. environmental right. issues, just even traffic, um, it, it's almost almost next to impossible to really separate that, isn't it? You're well, going into more individual generics in general. Well, the individual would make it even more compelling that you have to go individual. But do we have enough knowledge uh, uh, to say that what works for one, let's say, ethnic community that has certain dietary habits, certain lifestyle? Uh, obviously, I cannot generalize from white Caucasians from uh, a region up north to what will be appropriate for Chinese Canadians, let's say, living in Toronto, absolutely. So, so what we, we are hoping to do in Toronto, and we are working also very closely with the Ontario Health Study, that, uh, that is, of course, uh, using very superficial measures, just at this point, mostly questionnaire-based measures, in tens or hundreds of thousands of Ontarians where then you can, of course, get a feel for the differences between the different, for example, ethnic communities, right? Or between people living in this part of Toronto versus that part of Toronto. So we'll have to go through that. And of course, at the end of the day, it's about the numbers. Now, if I, if I can do this on a much larger scale, then of course, I will be able to say, well, we need to fine tune certain things this way here versus that way here. So we, we always keep in mind this, this very uh, issue. I tell you that we are, for example, with OHS, we are now beginning to work on the relationship between green space in greater Toronto area and mental and physical health. Just simple association study map, uh, based on available maps of green space in GTA and uh, information that we are getting through OHS questionnaires about self-reported physical and mental health to see whether there is uh, now, after taking into account all those other things that will be difficult to dissociate from who you are, where you live, right, and 
how much you make and, and, and all this stuff, we, we should be able to get, for example, at issues such as that, such as green space. Yeah. How do you see this playing out in terms of the way our healthcare system works currently? Do you think that this would require major restructuring? Or are we still recording? <laughs> uh, thanks for this question. I think that uh, our philosophy now is that uh, no, the healthcare system cannot do it. Because healthcare system, the way that, that it has operated for the past you know, 50 years or so, is set up to treat and fix. And, and we are all used to it. In fact, we, we, we like the ideas of embryonic stem cells that will replace our hearts when they fail because we really like the idea of doing whatever we want and when it breaks, they'll fix it. So in fact, even the, the population is not used, uh, is not ready for it and the government forget it, right? Because they, they really have to answer this, this, uh, uh, this uh, need that we have created by creating this kind of system and, and the expectation that they will fix us, and it costs a lot of money. So I don't think there is any hope in the, in the, in the near future that an approach of the sort that, that I'm interested in, personalized preventive medicine, will be funded through the existing healthcare system. So what is the alternative? I think the alternative is to develop inexpensive tools that will allow you and me by using them to take our health into our own hands. And so it, I think it has to be grassroots in a way. It's, and, and it's happening already. There are, for example, in terms of genetic information, you might have heard about 23andMe. That's a company, it's so-called direct-to-consumer uh, genotyping. You, you send uh, a swap of your buccal swap, and for $100, you get the genetic information about uh, your genetic risk for different common disorders, but also, of course, for monogenic disorders. And I think that this kind of approach that really starts with the consumer is the only chance or the first chance, chance that something like this can take off. Yeah. You've chosen to study cigarettes as the external factor, that cigarette smoking is down for a stable and a small percentage. Have you considered, or is it already underway, studying indoor air quality or chemical effects of chemicals? Yeah. Or? So the green space is related to it, okay. right? So, uh, so yes, we are we are moving in, in that direction. Uh, now, I have colleagues in Barcelona, in Spain, where they are really interested and and very well equipped for studies of air quality uh, with uh, very detailed, uh, again, uh, expensive equipment that in their study they placed. Uh, in and outside uh, 20 schools in Barcelona selected in such a way that 10 of them are close to high uh, car traffic in the city and 10 are matched on many different things but are in areas with very low air traffic. And now they are studying both cognitive abilities of those children but moving also into imaging the brains of those kids. Now, the interesting thing with population neuroscience, when you combined epidemiology and genetics is that you can, uh, and I didn't have time to get into this today, but you can, you can use the genes to tell you what is the likely mechanism by which, for example, air quality is affecting your body, right? So with the green space, I can give you an example that we might be able to, once we have the genetic material also of all those participants, and and that's what OHS is doing. They are taking blood samples of, of their participants. So once you have the funding for all this, you can, for example, identify uh, a pathway. Let's say my hypothesis would be that if green space, lots of trees around me are good, I see the outcome, let's say the outcome is good, then it's because of uh, uh, having more oxygen available to me. So I will go and find a, a biological pathway that involves oxygenation. And I will find then genetic variations in that pathway. And if I'm right, then those who have a genetic variant that makes that pathway work very well, 
would be benefiting from the green space more than the ones uh, where the pathway is not working well. And all of a sudden, and we call it Mendelian, Mendelian randomization, uh, we, have, we use it as so-called instrumental variable to inject causality into that relationship. Okay? So, so that's, that's the beauty of, of combining different approaches that you can dissect uh, things like this. Thank you. You talked a touch a little bit on some of your animal work. Are there any other animal models that you might pursue to sort of that would be maybe easier to answer some of these questions that you're getting at? So with the transgenerational because the magnet is for lifespans, you can manipulate it. Yeah. Are there any ideas or the ones that you're saying? This, this animal work was not done by me. It's okay. our colleagues in California. But we are doing some other animal work that, that, that has nothing to do with what I was telling you about today, but it's about testosterone and how testosterone affects white matter. There are some interesting things that are happening there, and we are doing electron microscopy in, in animals after gonadectomy, etc. Now, <clears throat> transgeneration question, absolutely. I mean, and then there is a, a, a growing body of work that is uh, showing that, and I didn't touch on it, that the environment induced uh, modifications in the genome that influence gene expression, many of them are wiped out uh, by the time you get to the next generation. But some of them are transmitted to the following generation. And so that's when we talk about really transgenerational uh, inheritance. That in fact the sins of our uh, ancestors are uh, with us. Now, there are some interesting studies in worms actually, uh, relevant for longevity. They showed that, I forget the detail, uh, uh, which, which particular molecule uh, it was, but essentially, uh, they modified epigenetically one particular mo uh, molecule, and that modification was inherited. That oh, sorry, that modification increased longevity in the worm, the uh, earthworm, right? And and then that modification was transmitted to the second, third generation, and they all lived longer. By the time it got to the fourth generation, it was wiped out, and the fourth generation lived again the same. Uh, number of days as, as the beginning. So, so, and that's really, I mean, there is tremendous amount of work that is happening in, in the context of uh, trans, uh, transgenerational transmission of epigenetic changes in the context of depression, stress, uh, you name it, of this sort. Fascinating field. Well, I'd like to say thank you. That was an amazing presentation. And uh, we're very, very um, excited that you might get funded and then come back and tell us some of the results. That would be wonderful to hear. So, thank so, you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you very much. Thanks.